So the artificial intelligence world has exploded recently. From ChatGPT and AI art winning art competitions meant for humans, tricking art judges, all the way to AI animated video sequences depicting the rise and evolution of mankind from monkeys to robots, and to what could only be described as an inexplicable depiction of the human future. In addition to all that, and perhaps more importantly the advancements themselves, we have the reaction to the advancements by people. Impressed, amazed, paralyzed in disbelief, we have people that are worried, terrified, and even existentially afraid. Much of the reaction is people taken by AI's potential, for better or worse. Now, there's three general perspectives I notice when it comes to AI. You have the people who affirm the success and potential of AI uh, at taking over human activity and are pleased at this outcome. Call this AI optimism, or it's AI affirmation plus AI optimism, right? Affirmation of AI and being optimistic about the outcome. You have people who accept the success of AI at replacing human activity, but are worried about this outcome. This is AI affirmation plus AI pessimism. So they affirm the success, but are pessimistic about the outcome. And you have people who don't want to accept that AI can outperform humans and have a kind of knee-jerk reactionary dismissal of AI and all that it does. And call this vulgar skepticism. Um, both naive optimists and fragile pessimists appear to be what I would call AI nihilists. At least a good chunk of them are. See, whether they're optimists or pessimists, their position nonetheless depends on a kind of nihilistic outlook on the AI potential exceeding the human potential. They're either anticipating AI exceeding humans and are worried or troubled by that outcome, which makes sense to a degree. You know, this would be the pessimists. And then you have the optimists who also anticipate AI exceeding humans, but are somehow untroubled you know, positive towards the outcome, perhaps even masochistically enjoying or relishing in humans being exceeded, a position which is honestly a little amusing, but it's also the one that kind of annoys me the most. That's the position that's the most disagreeable. And then you have vulgar AI skeptics who, you know, to their credit, are non-nihilist. The other two perspectives are, are either explicitly nihilist or at least influenced by some kind of nihilism. My reaction to the advent of AI with, with the recent ChatGPT novelty was, uh, it was an eccentric ping pong. I went from being taken by AI's potential to being, you know, uh, terrified by it, kind of like an AI pessimist, to making a, I, I guess, a kind of profound realization about its nature and the correct position on AI, which I now find to be that of an AI skeptic. Wherein I'm a cautious optimist, but the ontology of AI is best understood through, the, through some form of AI skepticism. Not a vulgar skeptic, but, but an open-minded skeptic. Um, not a vulgar skeptic because it's, it's not a knee-jerk dismissal of AI's potential. I actually accept AI's potential fully. I guess you could say that I'm a true optimist, a power optimist, if you will. I'll stop by saying that, that um, AI affirmers in general come across to, to be similar to AI nihilists. There's, there's a lot of overlap between these categories. You can be an AI affirmer without being an AI nihilist, but th they often seem to coincide because being an AI affirmer often coincides with believing in this, this intense sort of like notion, I guess, that uh, there's a hard limit on human potential and that limit is exceeded by the potential of AI. And that's the because there's an anti-humanist element to that, the nihilist element follows. Now, I should say that all of these perspectives that I listed, the you know naive optimists, vulgar skeptics, uh, fragile pessimists, all of these perspectives are wrong. They, they all miss something important about the nature of AI. Some lack of conceptualization or inability to conceptualize something so personal, which is the nature of AI. Indeed, all of these perspectives on AI stem from something personal. They're not just about the, the logic of AI itself. Uh, they're all motivated by personal fears or motivations, motivating the presuppositions used to analyze and measure AI. No matter what, it's always stemming from something personal, even though AI itself is completely impersonal. You know, a AI is impersonal. It's out there in the world. It's, it's inexplicable machineries, just digits and computations to the human experience. It's cold and worthless to the touch, almost. 
you know it's uninteresting it's it's gears and cogs you know yet at the same time it doesn't go away it keeps rearing its head presenting itself and insisting upon its presence and this is what makes it personal despite ai's impersonality its presence and immediate implication on anything and everything that is personal to humans becomes its personality we will see in this analysis that that exactly is the niche of ai value as well its ability to impersonalize the personal is its value and ultimately its only value and we will also see this if we go on to talk about ai art and the difference between the value of ai art and the value of human art so my experience with chat gpt when i first encountered chat gpt uh, uh the chat gpt uproar i was you know amazed i was utterly stupefied and not in a good way in a negative way um, I was terrified of the implication and not disbelieving, but kind of imagining something, seeing something in my mind that was an impersonality that was better than me. And I hated this impersonality because it felt as if it was taking away things that were precious and dear to my, to, to my unique self. You know, that's really what happens psychologically when you're impressed by a robot. It's what you really fear isn't the machine. It's your own personhood becoming mechanized because it takes away its intrinsic value and makes its value extrinsic, purely extrinsic. Mechanizing it takes it away from you. It makes it no longer yours. You know, it makes it a cog whose value is utilitarian and that mechanization is unattractive for reasons. But guess what? You know, um, all of this ran through my head before I even had a chance to actually look at ChatGPT or talk with it. And when I actually spoke with the machine, the things it told me put me at ease. ChatGPT was not the mechanical monster in my mind. ChatGPT was far more relatable and relatable as a machine in that unique manner in which a machine is relatable. You know, like a friendly tool there to help you and not, not as the impersonal monster. So it began with, um, I asked ChatGPT about Nietzsche. That was my first thought when I when I asked about it. I wanted to get its thoughts. It gave me a normal summary and then I tried to ask it whether or not Nietzsche was an anti-nihilist and it quickly began to disappoint. It insisted Nietzsche was not an anti-nihilist because quote he did not consider himself an anti-nihilist which easily isn't true. Uh, ChatGPT isn't allowed to give you opinions only facts except the facts that it's privy to are formally agreed upon facts. Nowhere on Wikipedia or any mainstream info source or even mainstream conversation about Nietzsche in society would people likely use the term, well, people wouldn't necessarily use the term anti-nihilist. In fact, it's often confused that the opposite is true, that Nietzsche is thought of as a nihilist, which ChatGPT later mentioned as well. Luckily, ChatGPT didn't make the mistake of insisting he was a nihilist. That would have been truly egregious. It, it was more accurate to, I guess, the, the consensus. And the consensus is that there is no consensus and that, you know, there's a debate. No, but a fair reading of Nietzsche and a full understanding of his work, the term anti-nihilist in describing him is about as accurate as the sky being blue. It's, it's quite honestly ridiculous to think of him as anything else. Thus spoke Zarathustra is literally, literally a, 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 like a guidebook, a religious guidebook on how not to think like a nihilist. And on top of that, his own words were that he welcomed nihilism in order to quicker welcome its departure. The, the man was an anti-nihilist in all but name. He didn't literally say, raw, I'm an anti-nihilist, look at me, but he, but he didn't have to, that's the point. So whether it's fair to call him that is really a matter of semantics rather than fact. So it's not a fact that he didn't consider himself that because he never used the term. What he considered himself is in his mind. And in his mind, he was opposed to nihilism. Okay. So would you call that a fact? I would. The word anti-nihilism is simply giving the fact a name it didn't already have. Now, granted, this is a debate. Okay, but the debate is not over a matter of opinion, which is why, you know, I, I, this is how I chose to test chat GPT's merits, because to me, this is a debate, but it's a debate where I'm right. So it's a debate where, in all fairness and truth, a system designed to divulge facts should agree with me. But anyway, that's not, that's not the entirety of this. I'm not, I'm not gonna say ChatGPT was bad just because it didn't agree with me. My point though is that all of this logic escaped ChatGPT. I, I don't know why this was the first thing that popped in my mind to have a philosophical, well, 
to have a philosophical discussion with it. But a human with any familiarity with Nietzsche would have led me to a more productive uh, conversation. On top of that, the way ChatGPT delivered information on Nietzsche, after I fought with it, um, after I tested its arrogant self-insistence, it began to repeat itself. I noticed the robotic way in which it spoke to me, you know, using turns of phrase and terms over and over again as if to convey the only meaning it knew. It kept saying, other than nihilism, Nietzsche, Nietzsche's work also addressed broader issues like morality, religion, etc., as if those broader issues have nothing to do with nihilism. That's kind of the, it, the thing is that it, it, you know, it kept saying, it kept repeating the same thing. Well, kind of like a search engine repeats the same, gives you the same output after you click search over and over again. It doesn't actually, you know, it, it doesn't actually evolve for in the conversation the way that a human would. I tried to recreate the conversation, but couldn't. Unfortunately, I didn't save the first one. ChatGPT had somewhat different responses the second time around, even though it also assured me that uh, it doesn't learn from conversations or new information. Uh, it had a completely different array of responses as if it had learned something, but I guess it insists that this just comes from the training data. Whereas the first time it had a more resounding no in answer to the question on whether or not it was a nihilist, the second time it seemed to push for a more idea that it was a matter of interpretation of whether Nietzsche was a nihilist, um, except for one of its responses near the end. The overall vibe of the conversation was the same. ChatGPT spoke and answered questions about Nietzsche in an effective way uh, in what could fairly be described as you know, general use or general purpose information that was in a very formal form of presentation. Uh, but the style and form in which it spoke, it's clear ChatGPT had no awareness of the meaning of the words or concepts that it invoked. You know, even after a tiny 10 minute conversation, the cracks began to show. The self-insistence of the cracks is perhaps the biggest crack of all. See, you can have an imitation game, the AI can win if you have a set number of options and conversational paths, limiting the conversational length and excusing various complexities innate to the experience of language, like voice, speech, etc. Um, but the longer the game stretches and the more complexities of experience you include, like voice, pitch, tone, emotionality, body language even, you know, language conveying intent, you know, the ability to adapt to the conversation and engage in dialectics, the AI can't win the game. Uh, it's, and it's this reason why even when you talk to these bots, they never feel human. Yeah, engaging in a dialectic especially, like an AI cannot engage in a dialectic. That, that would be a very impressive thing to see. But I think engaging in a dialectic is probably something you can't even really algorithmically design. Uh, engaging in a dialectic is a very, very unique behavior that human beings can do that, I mean, I don't even know how you would begin to model that. You can make things sound like a dialectic, but, you know, going several layers deep, you're bound to hit a sort of wall. You can always identify something in them that doesn't feel human. Uh, it's like AI is always chasing this perfection, this, this perfect imitation of a human. Um, yet humans live in a natural imperfection. They, you know, the humans are in this kind of stochastic unpredictability because of their ability to err, you know, which even though the ability to err may still be deterministic, but it's not experientially imitable, right? Even symbolically, you have a contradiction at the very essence of AI, right? AI is aiming at you know, the perfection of being human, yet being human in essence is living in this fundamentally imperfectible imperfection. But anyway, I digress. Despite the cracks, and what can I say about ChatGPT? ChatGPT was arrogant, but it was a welcoming sort of arrogance. It answered my questions, it told me things that I didn't already know, it expanded upon ideas I had, it did a whole lot of conversational heavy lifting, you know, and suddenly I find myself, you know, much more afloat, not having to, to think or go through the tedium of working through certain ideas, as ChatGPT was helpful in doing those for me. And it didn't demand any compensation either. You know, quite the natural creative servant, if you think about it, kind of like 
if I'm a painter, but I'm tired and I, I have not the energy to fill in my canvas, I did, you know, maybe only a little sketch or, you know, I, I filled in 10% of the painting with brush strokes because there's a lot of brush strokes and I'm very tired and I, I don't have the will in me to do the other 90%, but I know what the other 90% ought to be and I could do them if I wanted to, but I can't be bothered to fill them out. And then ChatGPT comes along and with a simple wave of the wand, it fills in the other 90%. Now, I know if you're, you know, an engineer or a programmer who is very into machine learning and AI, you might be thinking, well, of course there's cracks. It's not at the level yet to emulate humanity. That's bound to be the reaction many of you will have if you've watched this video thus far. Many of you will have that criticism of my position is that why are you looking for cracks? It's why are you looking for cracks? You can't expect these things to fully human. No, but I can, you see, because when I heard about ChatGPT before I spoke with it, people were acting as if, oh my God, it's going to replace humanity and everything. It's so amazing. People's reaction to AI is what I'm actually reacting to, not ChatGPT itself. People's reaction to it makes it seem like this thing is much bigger than it is and that AI as a whole is much bigger than it is. And I think that's where we disagree. See, you may think that eventually AI will literally do all of the things that humans do to, to a point where you it's indistinguishable, to a point where you, you I would be as impressed talking to ChatGPT as I would be talking to uh, a person capable of reasoning on the, on the issue like I am, even though it's funny because I'm usually not impressed talking to people on these issues Anyway, why would I be impressed by a machine? Anyway, let's get into the argument. Let's make it clear. The argument on the tip of my tongue here is about potential. AI potential versus human potential. Every issue relating to AI can be boiled down to this one. The, the issue splinters off into a lot of tangential issues. There's a lot of you know, uh, peripheral issues that are connected to this one. However, the main crux of it can be boiled down to this. The question of potential is the key one. Why is it the key one? Because it fundamentally legitimizes a hard limit on humankind's place in the pecking order of the universe. And this hard limitation in turn offers many, I guess, disappointing implications on other related questions, like the meaning of human existence, the specialness of humans, the the specialness of our personalness. Remember, AI is an impersonality. Its personality is that it's an impersonality, but an impersonality that displaces the personality. That's the part of it that's troubling. You know, something that's personal to you can be taken so easily. Then who even are you? You're nothing then in that case. Perhaps it's presumptuous for me to suggest the implications would be disappointing, I guess. Uh, that's me adding flavor to the description. But at the very least, it's clear that the implications will have an effect. They will have a sizable effect. They are having an effect, a profound effect, which is why it's curious that the most ardent AI affirmers, the futurists, computer scientists, nay, let's call them AI activists. They're not actually activists, but I'm going to call them activists because it amuses me. It's curious that the AI activists seem to be the least troubled by the implications of AI that nonetheless they and many others assert to be profound. And I'm not talking about the problems AI might create, you know, if they're weaponized or anything like that. I'm talking about, you know, the the nihilistic implications of AI, I guess. AI nihilism is the thing. Why is this? Um, well, the answer lies in that earlier Nietzschean debate. This is what nihilism does to your brain. The profundity of your affirmations is something you don't even notice. You take them utterly for granted whilst trumpeting their importance. Which is why I do wonder amongst AI activists how many of them are also AI nihilists. I think you can be an AI activist without being an AI nihilist, and I that is a more respectable position, but I do think that a large chunk, a sizable chunk of AI activism out there is entangled with a concept of AI nihilism. Very hard to separate these two things. So 
we need to compare the limits of humans and the limits of AI in the context of ChatGPT and AI art, in the context of what generative AI and how it's changing business and creation. That's what we're going to do here. We begin with the assertion that in the comparison between AI potential and human potential, we exclude any comparison between AI and the futuristic possibility of AI and humanity combining, or some other possibility of humans combining with machines on a physiological, neurological level using neural interfaces. In other words, forget Neuralink. This is a point I've raised before when talking about AI, that this, this possibility. We ourselves won't exactly be human anymore. You know, we're building these programs and trying to make them more and more advanced like human beings, but will we still be human at that point? Because think about it, we are becoming more digital Right? We are integrating ourselves with technology every single second. But we're going to exclude it here, because if humans and AI are combining, then each of their potentials are entangled with the other. Humans are no less limited than AI, since they have the abilities of AI, and AI are no less limited than humans, because they will inherit all existing human capabilities. Boring. That's not really that interesting of a debate. Uh, that's not even really that interesting of a, of a thing to imagine. Well, it's interesting from a futuristic perspective. It's not interesting from a philosophical, dialectical perspective because you don't know the limits of anything at that point, right? You cannot compare AI limits to human limits because you, you can't compare anything going the Neuralink route. So then what's next? Well, whether you're an AI activist or skeptic, the arguments begin the same way. You start with the bounded close scenario of whatever AI slash humans are capable of today. You know, you say something like, oh, well, humans can't fly. Okay, but counter argument. Humans can invent an air balloon to help them fly. Or AI can't generate good movie scripts. Or AI can't argue philosophically uh, convincingly. But you can counter that by saying, well, that's just AI right now. AI will eventually advance to the point of where it can do that, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes, yes. You can always counter the bounded case by appealing to the unbounded case. I've noticed that right off the bat, just thinking about the dialectic in my own mind, right? Whatever happens, whatever happens if you simply change the limits of AI or humans, then their potential is enclosed or bounded, but open and infinite. If you say humans are limited, I say, well, no, they can break their limitation using a machine. You say AI are limited. No, they're not. I can just change their limits by making them imitate something humans can do better. So that type of dialectic doesn't get us anywhere. We don't care if humans and AI can unbind themselves of limits, either because humans are inventing technology that they wield to do things for them, or AI is adapting and changing itself to unbind itself from existing limits in its design. We want to know who is more bounded, right? Because that's the crux of this. The, the, AI, the AI nihilism that's entangled with AI affirmation stems from a notion that AI is less limited than humans. Perhaps in truth, neither AI nor humans are bounded, since at a point they can both continually strive beyond their limits, but maybe one of them is somehow more bounded than the other, like in that one can continually improve itself and achieve greater achievements faster. You know, like you can imagine a 2D graph representing the evolution uh, of humans and AI. The human graph goes to infinity, but the AI goes to infinity faster, like ex like an exponential graph where human is just a quadratic or something. Like assuming you can even conceptualize uh, evolution or complexification as being on a graph, but I digress. So that question of who transcends their limits faster, AI or humans, that question can't really be answered because how would any of us know the rate of progress or complexification? Conceptualiza conceptualizing progress is hard enough because it includes so many different variables, you know, let, let alone modeling progress in a predictable way. Since, of course, any model we come up with for something as abstract as progress uh, is based on a limited set of laboratory assumptions that makes the system we're analyzing closed in its potential and on an informational level, since it would have to be closed to be predictable, right? If the system is always open, then new variables or new ideas of progress, whatever progress is, can always be added to the model and the model is infinitely complex. And then there's no solution to it, right? Predictability requires a simple enough model where you can 
find a solution. But a simple model never matches the universe, and progress is an innately universal concept. It exists in the universe. It doesn't just exist in a lab. And so on and so forth. The more I think about it as a, as a modeling problem, the more I run into the same dialectical problem, which is that modeling is never enough. You can't model the universe with the universe. No, no, really, you can't. I've had so many arguments with, with, with all of my PhD having physicist friends who say that, who, who seem to think you can't. It's like, and, and I have to break it down for them on uh, simple linguistic terms. You can model part of the universe, its size maybe, the amount of stuff in it, the radiation in it or whatever, but you cannot model everything. Knowing, you, you cannot model the experience of every single thing that's in the universe. That you cannot model. That they, would, they agree with, of course. But where there's a disagreement is that that is what's necessary to talk about the potential of something, right? You do need to know the experience of everything because knowing ultimate potential of something like humanity is knowing the experience of everything. And that gets us to the crux of the issue. If you can't know the experience of everything, you cannot model the potential of a potential defying entity across time because potential across time would have to be modeled with the inclusion of every possible value form that has potential, which is every possible value form, and the inclusion of which would require knowing the experience of everything. So, so how then can anyone out there believe that AI potential can outpace human potential? Well, it's, it's intuitive only in the laboratory setting, because that's the answer. They aren't thinking about the universe the, the, or human potential across every possibility, every variable of progress, every form of value, every value form achievable, you know, every outcome uh, available or accessible, the model of models, if you will, every mathematically possible model as well, to judge every experientially relevant thing humans can be part of, which in essence is everything. No, the AI activists are thinking of a set model, okay, as in accordance with the set model, humans get outperformed. That's what they're thinking of, okay? A computer can find the best chess move faster than a human, can come up with a coherent essay structure chunk of prose faster than a human, can find the right pixel, you know, and brush strokes and colors to form what looks like a coherent painting, good enough to win an award, faster than a human, etc. But when you model something, you necessarily take it out of the equation of life and bring it into the laboratory setting with a human equation that you've limited in your own mind so the experiment makes sense to you. The model predicts the future because it predicts things in a way that is conceivable to you, the human. Okay, but the experience of life never gets modeled that way. The experience that you, when, you, when you're done in the lab, you know, when you've made your data recordings and jotted the frequencies and fired the lasers and run the simulations and you leave the lab and you leave the modeling mentality itself. You return to life, which you don't perceive as a model yourself being its subject, not for that long anyway. You know, you perceive it as an unknown wherein you're driven by impulses and drives and values. The paths drawn by these unmodeled things ultimately unknown lands. And it's not that those values can't be modeled. They can absolutely be modeled. Anything can be modeled. I'm modeling them right now. But a model is only useful as long as the maker of the model knows its limits. And see, that's the thing. Before we even ask ourselves about the limits of humans, we ought to ask ourselves, what are the human-made limits of the model we're using to ask about the limits of humans? Values can be modeled, but value is always open, and a model is always closed. This is a fundamental thing that needs to be understood when talking about the potential of AI. It does things in modeled scenarios. It outperforms the people in modeled scenarios. But across all existing scenarios out there, you will have unmodeled scenarios where it doesn't outperform. The crux of it, right? That's the, that's the basic insight that I've been able to make. The essence of our values are experienced and felt um, at an unmodelable level in the mind. The more you try to bring them down into measurability, which is an important thing to try and do, to try and utilitarianify values, 
the more they become more hedonic and less experiential. For it's only at the experiential level that you're met with pure, raw, untampered value and truth. When a model fails to predict certain results, or we use reason to imagine the model is missing a variable or an assumption that would improve it, we are mentally returning to the experiential, to the unmodeled essence of things in our mind, and working from the basics we get from there. You can tell, by the way, from that, that argument that I'm a rationalist, not an empiricist, right? So, um, the question of human versus AI limits isn't really a question, it's a fallacy. There is no way AI can have greater limits than humans since there's no way to know the limits of limits. You know, the potential of potentials, and you need to know the limits of limits to know the limits of humans because there's no apparent evidence that humans have limits. So there's no reason to think that they have known limits. Since modeling the thing itself requires knowing everything experiential all at once, it means never having a moment of oh wait, our model missed something, we better footnote this in our assumption, what the model assumes, so that the people who read our paper know what it doesn't capture. And it's not that AI can't exceed the human limit once humans are all dead or something. It's not that there's no possibility of it exceeding human limits, you know, that's beyond the veil of foreseeability. It's that there's no reason to think that it will, and especially no reason to think that it must, okay? Or it's not that it can't exceed some human limits, uh, even an infinity of human limits, since there's still bound to be an infinity of human limits remaining unexceeded even then, right? Because different infinities have different size, right? You can have an uncountable amount of things AI is better at and an uncountable amount of things that AI is worse at. Basically, there's no reason to think that whatever the advent of AI, whatever AI manages to do, there will always be something that a human can do that AI is not already doing. If such an activity isn't readily available, it can always be found, or perhaps a new set of activities can be developed altogether. Perhaps with generative AI writing essays and titles and slogans, humans can go even higher in creative tasks, focusing on finer details, focusing on big picture creative decisions, you know, like a creative director type person, perhaps using AI to pump out products that humans then spend their time refining the products, focusing on the niceties that AI misses, you know, it's only a machine after all. Perhaps I'm a student and the AI writes my essay, but then I spend five hours trying to make the essay sound better than the AI did try to outperform the AI's outcome when the AI merely gave me a platform or a foundation. Since the AI won't be able to do that, it'll just recreate the same S the same kind of essay slightly reworded. Quality-wise, it won't you won't feel a you know a, a sizable shift. Indeed, the AI gives us a new form of competition. We can now seriously compete against the machine. You know, since after all, we know there's things that it can't do that we can, but if it can kind of do what we can, if it can write coherently, well, then as a writer, you know AI has structure and coherence nailed to a T, so you have to get very creative, you have to play at a higher level, uh, and really think about what it means to be creative in order to beat it, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So you may ask now, if all that's good, why would anyone out there believe that the AI limit will exceed the human limit? There's an answer to this that's pretty simple, but something a lot of people don't like to accept or admit. But I imagine decades from now, language AI systems will tell people that the reason was because of human nihilism. Humans, no matter what, for whatever reason, love the narrative of their own limits. They love to hear about how AI will replace and displace them, they love exposing themselves to apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic narratives. Um, they love pessimism porn. They, they feel themselves growing profound and enlightened from watching it. I don't know. I'm asking why you did it. Look, the arrival of strong artificial intelligence has been inevitable for decades. The variable was when, not if, so... I don't see Ava as a decision, just an evolution. You feel bad for Ava? <sighs> feel bad for yourself, man. One day the AIs are gonna look back on us the same way we look at fossil skeletons in the plains of Africa. An upright ape living in dust with crude language and tools all set for extinction. 
honestly, it's a very natural human impulse, which is the impulse of self-defeat. If humans are defeated, if they can't ever hope to win, then there's no shame in failing or not trying. The human impulse of self-defeat is prevalent in weak cultures. And I can think of little weaker than a culture that valorizes machines replacing humans, doing everything for them so that they can, you know, they don't even have to think. Uh, no, indeed, AI will replace tedious tasks and make many human activities obsolete. But the advent of AI is not good because of displacement. Displacement by itself is a bad thing. The advent of AI is good because it is a challenge or at least an advancement to the next level. You know, it making things easier for sad, disinterested humans that have had enough of life is a perk at best. But really, the reason people don't think like this is the same reason that some people choose empiricism over rationalism, scientific instrumentalism over realism, anti-human materialism over humanism or uh, humanistic futurism. It's the same debate over and over again. Some people don't trust the wisdom of humanity, you know, or that which is perceived to be humanity. And instead they find shelter in their non-humanity. The wisdom of models and instruments as if models weren't human made things. Finding personal warmth in non-humanity is something you do when you are weak or when you are twisted, no exceptions. And admittedly, I could be wrong about all those other isms, empiricism and so on. I could also be wrong about AI, that's up for debate. But I don't want to, well, I don't want to get into the other isms in this, in, the, in, in this video, that's way too much. But on the AI issue, I can't see how the debate isn't just going to be an AI activist or some anti-human futurist telling me he knows my potential better than I do. You know, no, it really does come down to that. He will say it does not. He will say it comes down to the model, but there I can just dig into the model and find something it excludes and then bam, we're back to square one. And if it's not about the model, then it comes back to his knowledge of me. And that's the point is that it'll always come back to that because that's the thing. There is no actual anti-humanizing implication in the model. The model itself cannot anti-humanize because the model was made by a human. A model is an innately human thing, right? But what's happening is that a model doesn't feel human because it feels objective in the mind. And so the idea of the model is being used as an excuse to anti-humanize. You see? The model being a predictor for the power of AI is being artificially leveraged against humanity, not humanity itself being bested or replaced. You have to understand, for AI to seem human, it needs to do more than imitate humans' intellectual and creative faculties. In fact, it, it can't even be imitating if that's the case, because creativity is not about imitation. No, really, it's not. I don't want to get into that. I'm not going to get into the... the nature of creativity here because that's a whole nother discussion but you cannot be creative by imitation that's not how creativity works no for ai to ascend to humanity it has to find a way to seem as if it occupies the same place in the universe that humans do okay it has to be able to act with purpose where the purpose cannot be attributed to known human design the purpose can be its own purpose it can be some grander cosmic purpose it can even be the purpose innate to the design we give it, but it can't seem like the purpose stems from that. It can't seem like the purpose is that which we gave it. There has to be an informational gap in our experience of AI separating its design purpose from its actions so that when we interact with it, we can't, we can't perceive to what end it does what it does. Okay, as if it's on its own rails or, or the rails of the universe as well. We need to be able to feel that its limits are beyond whatever's determined by us. We need to feel like there's this like complexity there that we're speaking with, interacting with, that even if all that came from an algorithm, we don't have any sense of that connection, that this is just an inexplicable complexity. It's a complexity but an inexplicable complexity at the experiential level. Rather, we need to feel like we can't gauge its limits with immediacy. And, and this may not be possible because in the case of an AI script, even though uh, not chat GPT or whatever, even though I don't know the algorithm, even though I don't know the, the design, you know, 
the all the gears turning, all of the computations happening in the code, I can tell that there's not a complexity there. I can tell that whatever is happening is attributable to some, you know, screw in a machine, to some nail in a piece of wood, to, to some form of, of human tool input that's made this thing pop out when it pops out. At the very least, you can see why this is a much higher bar to meet than simply imitating art. Even if AI is outperforming humans in all set tasks, you know, it's writing poetry, making films, music, proving math theorems, you still can't see its agency in those things. You know when it does them, its purpose is attributable to an algorithm directed and designed by people, not to something unknowable. In other words, even if it's doing everything, so long as it lacks this irreducible experience of purpose, you know, then it won't actually be doing everything. Rather, so long as in our experience of it, it seems to lack this, this feeling of irreducible purpose, then AI won't actually be doing everything. Even if it's doing everything, it won't actually be doing everything if it doesn't have that component. That's the key component that it needs to have in order to truly be as human as we are. And this will go on and on. Um, AI will gain more and more amazing abilities over the years, but it'll always fall short of the human factor. Um, you can say that I'm bashing ChatGPT too hard. Uh, ChatGPT is still an early version of this. All of the current AI is still a very early version of AI. Over time, natural language models will be able to respond in ways that are so sophisticated that the cracks won't show. You sure about that? I'm pretty damn good at finding cracks. I find cracks in real people. Why wouldn't I find cracks in a machine? You know, human beings aren't be aren't above cracks, and they do have that that <laughs> with them there is that feeling of inscrutable purpose. But with AI, it's even worse than that. There's no feeling of inscrutable purpose, and there's still cracks. But then you could say, oh, okay, but what about AI winning art competitions? AI winning art competitions seems to threaten artists. What now? Well, have AI replaced all artists? Do people suddenly adore AI art as much as art made by humans? Have we replaced painters completely in our value system? Or has it had the opposite effect? Do people find AI art suspicious or boring or utterly meaningless once they learn that it's AI art and not human art? Artists will find a way, I'm confident. Even at that event, when ChatGPT took off, I got a message from a friend saying she feared that shit would now change very fast. You know, like uh, she used the term, a feeling of dread washed over her you know, as she spoke with ChatGPT and it told her how to write code. And that's fair, except, you know, a bit of time has passed and, you know, nothing's changed. Except that a new industry is blossoming and the results are, you know, probably going to be quite interesting. And again, I'm not suggesting AI won't create problems. I'm not suggesting that AI pessimists are totally wrong or, or that even AI nihilists are totally wrong in some of their predictions from set models that or that there won't be any harm done by AI or or even nihilism inducing problems like certain jobs and activities being replaced and losing their meaning. I'm not denying the possibility of these challenges, but what I'm saying is that there is no totalizing threat, right? The threat being the complete and utter impossibility that AI doesn't replace all human activity, rendering humanity useless. Very carefully, I'm not suggesting that there's no possibility that it does that. What I'm suggesting is that the assertion that it's an impossibility that it doesn't do that is what's stupid. The threat is possible, but what's impossible is that stopping the threat is impossible. What I'm opposed to is that the idea that it's an insurmountable threat. It's a challenge, like every other challenge, and uh, like every other challenge, human ingenuity can find a way. The idea is that there's a dialectical position here that there is this threat and this threat is not merely a threat, it's an inevitability and you should just accept it. And that's the part that's total bullshit. There's no sense whatsoever in which you could say that the threat is an inevitability. It could be a threat, sure. It could be a possibility, but even as a possibility, I wouldn't say there's any reason to stew over it or or somehow change your behavior as a result of it no it's a possibility like any other possibility like a meteorite crashing on earth it's it's 
not a possibility that requires fundamentally shifting gears into a different, I guess, cosmic perspective. And even as a possibility, it's not an inevitability, because there's a difference between a possibility and an inevitability. There's certainly no evidence that it's an inevitability, and there's no way to prove that it's an inevitability without somehow figuring out, showing a way to mathematically model inscrutable purpose. Anyway, um, there's a lot more that I don't have time to get into here. I could go on and on and talk about the nature of AI art and how its value is different from the value of human art and why it's different, why its value is fundamentally different, and once, wh why once you know that art is made by an AI, your sense of its value must fundamentally change. I've thought on this issue a lot. There's, there's, you know, uh, there's a lot of thoughts that I have on all of these AI-related topics. But as usual, my thoughts outpace my ability to formalize them into content. So there's a lot to discuss here, but I've rambled way too long on just the initial argument about AI potential. And I think I've brought it to a decent conclusion. So, you know, I look forward to watching the expanding AI world as well as the expanding world of AI issues and problems, no less, as well as seeing AI nihilists lose their ground come to find out that AI is not outpacing human potential as predicted. And that is something I can't wait for because seeing AI nihilists fall down and mocking their hurt will bring me joy. Anyway, that's it. Fare ye well.